All right. Happy Friday, everybody. <laughs> Actually, I say happy Friday every time and I realize it is not Friday for you guys, but um, we only record on Friday. So every time you listen to this podcast, it will be a happy Friday. I hope that brings some uh, some good energy to your day, whether it's Monday, Wednesday, whatever day it is for you. It's a Friday here. So happy Friday. I hope everybody is doing great. It is going to be a good episode because we got Brock Holloman with us from Florida. Um, Brock does build to rent. In fact, he does a lot of things and uh, he has a lot of wisdom to impart on us today. So I am ex super excited to jump into this. Brock, thank you very much for hopping on the show. Gabe, thanks for having me on, man. Can't wait to talk. There you go. Uh, I told you before we got on here, um, we really like starting with stories, hearing how people got to where they are. Um, so why don't you take us to the beginning of your real estate journey and tell us how you got started in real estate? Yeah, so I'll try to go. I'll try to go quick because I could I could take hours to tell the story. Um, <laughs> but it really started for me when I was in in high school. My father was a construction guy. He mm. he uh, he was a builder growing up, and you can't really real estate. I mean, it's valuable. Land is valuable, but real estate becomes a lot more valuable when you actually construct something and put it to use. So um, that was always you know a wonderful like another wing or spoke. But I loved the real estate side. Um, you know, but he kind of introduced me to it just by being a builder. Um, but back then he had, uh, you know, we were in the, the financial markets um, and this was in high school, by the way, I started when I was in, it was like 2011 um, when I was really getting interested in it, but I had a lawn mowing business. Um, and instead of a, a regular, you know, customer, it was the banks that had all these vacant properties. So I had a, a couple banks and they had, you know, 30, 40 properties a piece and I'm sitting there, you know, mowing their lawns and what's well, a lot easier because you collect from, from one, two people instead of, you know, 80. That's um, smart. Yeah. How'd and, you get, uh, how'd you get in contact with these banks as I'm sure this was in your early twenties, maybe. Yeah. Well, thank Now this was, I was 17. So oh, uh, shit. Okay. 16, 16 and 17 actually. Yeah. Uh, just bit, just was able to drive, um, and I had a I had a bank account in there, and I remember I had probably I had a few hundred dollars in my account, and then my my dad's friend worked at the bank. Um, ah, there you go, connection. I remember I didn't know how to manage any money. I remember having overdraft fees, and he took me in there and was and was like, "You're gonna you're gonna try to negotiate these fees off of your account." So he made me do that and I'm sitting there next to him. And then, you know, one thing leads to another. I had a couple lawn mowing people back then. And then, you know, just, they said, you know, we'll give you a try out on this. So anyways, that, that ended up working out pretty good because as I'm sitting there mowing these lawns, um, you know, I'm thinking about vacant properties <laughs> and like all this stuff. And this is in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, but that's, that's sort of, that's, that's where it kind of, began uh, because you know my mind's thinking about real estate even though we're talking we're talking lawn mowing um but back then you know everything there was so much vacancy as far as like vacant homes and all this stuff that people had lost in the crash mm, yeah. and the big thing was auctions um i had no idea about these auctions um but I, I knew how to work a computer and the internet was was getting pretty good then you could figure out a bunch of stuff um, and I remember my dad one time, he said, you should check into these, these foreclosure auctions. But he, I, I'm at the time he was like thinking when I get out of high school, yeah. which, you know, a couple of years, but, uh, I remember as soon as he said that I was like searching it on, on Done. let's do it, dad. Yeah. <laughs> so I, look, I look it up and found the next auction. And I, I was terrible at going and showing up at school and terrible at grades. But, uh, I remember real right after that, I went down to a, an auction I found online at the courthouse steps. And, you know, by chance, my father had a speeding ticket court date that date. And I remember being on the steps at the auction and then making eye contact. I'm like, oh, shit, here he comes. <laughs> he thinks I'm at school. Um, and you know, I was a little nervous, but turns out he was he was pretty proud of me skipping school and being at this auction. Um, <laughs> you know, that that kind of rolls into things. But you didn't back then, like there was so much inventory that these banks had to offload off their books that. The, the rules were kind of relaxed. So nowadays, if you go to a foreclosure auction, you're going to have to pay cash nine out of 10 times right there. Yeah. You're going to have to bring a cashier's check or it's online or you have to have funds in an account. But back then, very lenient. 
uh, too much inventory. So you could have like 72 hours to pay. And Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And if you could talk them, sweet talk them a little bit, then you could buy another 24, 48 hours out of there. Oh, I'll be right there. I missed right, the bank right, today. Right. Gotta go talk to my guy. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, what I'm doing is like, you know, figuring out the internet, public records, who's buying cash in these little zip codes and that I won the bid in. And then, you know, just calling them up. And it was, it's not easy being 18 and, and showing up, you know, little kid trying to sell them a, a deal yeah. and telling them, you know, I know you're used to closing like a traditional investor. You close in 30 days, cash, blah, blah, blah. No, we got to close in 24 hours. Yeah. And you got to send the money <laughs> to this account over here. And, you know, no title work, no nothing like that. So it was, it was a little difficult, but at the same time, I was able to stack win after win after win, you know, a couple thousand, five thousand, seven thousand, you know, all these little wholesale fees. The cool thing was back then. Oh, you were wholesaling were, them. You would get, you would them. win the bid, right? You'd win the bid on, on the steps. And then you'd take that, that contract, that winning bid, and you'd take it to an investor and be like, Hey, I will give you this opportunity to buy this property. If you give me $5,000, $1,000, whatever. Yeah, That's well, genius. I wasn't even telling them what I was getting. I, I was telling them, you know, say I want it for, and these houses were so cheap. This is Memphis. Say I want one for twelve thousand. Mm. I know he's paying twenty four. I'm like, okay, I can get you the same house. We got to close quick. I can get it for you for eighteen, and then he would wire or she would wire the money to the uh, trustee's account at the attorney that, where they held the bid mm. for the auction. And then what they do is they take whatever ref so if I wired them a hundred grand on a, a twelve thousand dollar bid, they take a week or two and then they would cut a check back to whoever the bidder was, which was me. Oh, interesting. Okay. So huh. yeah, so they were basically paying me my wholesale fee, um, huh. which was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> That's not so a no longer is that a, a strategy that can be used, but it's a uh, pretty interesting. Yep. Yep. Unfortunately, but uh, maybe there's a way to do something like, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult though. I, there's not enough inventory now to make that, make that work. Um, but yeah, that, that led to that. Uh, finally stacked enough up to get my first couple of rental properties back then and then do a couple of flips and, you know, um, but also along the way fell on my face and blew all my money. Cause you know, you're a kid, you're not used to making that kind of money. You just start spinning, spinning, spinning and kind of, pump the brakes which was probably the worst thing that you could do because you feel like you're rich and oh i don't need to work today you know <laughs> take yeah. too many days off so big lesson learned there um but yeah you fast forward i guess it's now that's 13 years ago wow um so 13 years later now you know tons of flips tons of uh now we're doing a ton of new construction we're building a you know 150 200 houses a year down here in florida and you know much better market to be in and I learned, you know, buy and hold is really where you make the money in this game, uh, where you can produce cash flow and income, you know, over time and, you know, tax breaks and, you know, appreciation and all this kind of stuff. So in a nutshell, that's the last 13 years. <laughs> in a nutshell. I love it. Well, that's, it's a very colorful uh, starting story. I love to hear that. Um, so you, it sounds like you have, you got into uh, construction, um, which isn't a, a path that a lot of investors take, but those that do, they really like it. Um, what, it sounds like your dad had a construction background. Is that what kind of brought you that way to do new builds or, um, what got you into the new build side? Right. Yeah. So, so construction, like since I was a little toddler, I just remember being out on the job site with him. Like he was always he would always put his foot up my ass. Okay. Like yeah. make me feel bad. Like, Oh, you're sleeping and you want to stay at home with your mom today. Like, you know, <laughs> you know or you want to come be a man. So, okay. I'll come be a man. So anyways, always as like a, from a two year old to, you know, even on, remember on my 10th birthday, he was making me hold a screw and he, while he was drilling and it, it slipped and it went right through my finger and, you know, <laughs> yeah. just, just all this. So construction was just sort of in my blood, just being around them. Um, yeah. But with that being said, like when that story started in 2011, builders went bankrupt all over the country. So construction was at like a standstill. There yeah. was too much supply. All these vacant properties. Why do we need to build new houses and sell them for sixty thousand dollars when they'll cost one hundred and twenty to build? It makes no sense. Um, but you know, during those during the times of the wholesaling, like it went from, you know, I met the one guy, I remember my first investor, his name was Charles. And then I remember, you know, it leads to another and another, and then you got a full investor or buyer list that I'm wholesaling properties to. I, I come later learn, you know, as the, as time goes, the hedge funds were the real ones that you could make easy money with. 
as far as flipping to these guys. So I, that those were the more the connections I started to to develop. Then you know as prices came back enough and and those funds were gobbling up all the inventory, prices elevated to the point where you could now build something and sell it at a profit. Um, right. And I had never built anything. I know my my father had, um, and I was I had actually moved to Florida as fast as I could um, when I felt like I had enough money, and I thought, oh, I'll do the same thing down here. Um, fell on my face. It's totally different. You know, Memphis, you can buy houses for five grand down here. There's nothing like that. Um, and you're competing against people with, with real money. Um, so all, that whole game was not nonsense. But as I fell on my face, like I started to ask these guys, what about new construction? What about new construction? So one fund, um, and everybody probably knows them now they're publicly traded. They decided they were going to try out their first new construction built to rents. Um, with, and they actually, I sold them their first three okay. and it was, it's American homes for rent. Now they don't touch them. Uh, they have their own division, um, that, where they do their own built to rent in-house. They do their own development and all that stuff, but happy to say that we were the first ones to sell them any new construction. And it was in, it was in Memphis and, you know, my dad was still up there and they were still leery. They were like, Oh, but nobody's building. Um, do we do this? And so he had a partner, they were willing to roll the dice and, I said, well, let me just be your, let me just be your little, uh, your little Guinea fish. Pig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'll just sweep the floors. I'll just take notes. You know, you send me on to Home Depot, do whatever you want to do with me. And, you know, and I'll just get a brokerage fee and I'll work for free on the construction side, you know, shovel streets, whatever it is. So I just wanted to learn. Um, yeah. So that was it. And, and off those first three, I, I remember carting in investors from California I remember some other hedge funds and then all this stuff, like I'm, I'm touring them through there as fast as I can and trying to set up appointments to build a little bit of a reputation. One thing like leads to another and I, I get, you know, I can secure contracts now that were directly with me instead of, you know, my father and his partner um, were, you know, I could actually prove myself and all that kind of stuff and, and be able to, to get onto this game, you know, and, uh, and, and do some volume with the new construction. So that all worked out pretty well i ended up partnering up with some other folks um and you know partnerships don't always go the best yeah. um so anyways stuff happened ended up partnering with my father now my father and i started this company when uh we moved to florida i moved to florida he follows me him and my mom follow me um i think i could move to alaska they'd follow me there too <laughs> uh, but anyways we started something down here in 2018 uh where we only built nine houses that year Okay. The next year we did we did nineteen, uh, then we went to seventy six, then we went to you know one hundred and eighty eight, and you know now which just it's really snowballed into something that's that's turning out really great. Um, yeah. So so I'm um I'm curious. I've never done a new build. Everything that I bought um has been existing. I've added on to things that I have purchased, but I've never done a new build. So I don't know the process. Um, take us through step by step like that. Those first couple of deals, once you moved here to Florida, what were the steps you took? Um, and really going to as much detail as you can remember how you got the uh the new build side, the build to rent side uh up and running. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's two big parts of it. I mean, so when you are gonna choose an area for build to rent, you have to make sure that the numbers are gonna work. Like mm -hmm. you can't just pick any area. Um, and the number you're talking about is the rental rate. Right. The rental rate versus the, the cost of construction and the cost of land. Um, yeah. yeah. And the and the appraised value of the properties like we can't go into we can't go into a million dollar neighborhood and expect that we're going to be able to kill build to rent and cash flow. It's going to be, you know, that that middle that first starter home type of thing, maybe one step Workforce up. Workforce housing. Yeah. Right. Um, so the area needs to qualify first, um, so, which is Florida is is been is cheap compared to maybe seattle or maybe to california or new and, york and real quick uh turn your mic so it faces directly at your mouth here there you go perfect Keep going. so um yeah but so we we picked that and we we picked some areas and they're not that easy to find even though we're a cheaper place and then maybe we're not as cheap as we used to be definitely not um but we found some some different spots so the numbers qualify there and then when you're going to build in an area you know Every area that I've built in, whether it's in Tennessee, Mississippi, um, in, in any of these markets, we're in Florida, they're all different. And if you want to make money as a builder or, you know, build efficiently, 
as far as timeline goes, um, which a lot of people struggle with, you have to you have to know the ins and the outs of of everything. Like, what does the permitting process look like? You know, what what kind of what can make you not get a permit? What can, you know, cost be a big cost? Like I had never heard of endangered wildlife, you know, situation until I got to Florida. Like, you know, you, there was a month, uh, the worst month was we spent like $56,000 on, on endangered turtles to get them removed from, from various lots that we had purchased. Oh, wow. And, you know, you, you live and you learn, you know? Yeah. And then I bought this one and I, I didn't, I never knew about wetlands. Okay. I yeah. bought this, this multifamily spot that was supposed to host uh, 22 townhomes that we could build and, and keep. And, you know, I walked it in, in the dry season, didn't know anything about a dry or wet season when I was first got here to Florida <laughs> and everything looked great. You know, <laughs> and, <laughs> this is you know, perfect. Could, Let's build. Yeah. We, we, then we spent a hundred grand on plans and development stuff and come back six months later during the wet season and like the back half is a swamp mm. and then the, the you know the county then shuts it down because they say oh this is an endangered wetland uh when they didn't say that at the beginning and right. then the map gets revised and then you get you know you get screwed but you you gotta you gotta look out for these things but you live and you learn it's and it's hard to learn everything without really falling in your it. face a little bit yeah you have yeah. to do it yeah. Um, but yeah, so just every little mistake that is made or anything that we learn is all documented here. So it allows us to really speed um, through these processes. And, and you know, like McDonald's can't make a ton of hamburgers if, you know, they don't have a checklist. They don't know exactly what goes in each hamburger and it's on an assembly line to pump these things out. And that's kind of what we want to to model is, you know, fast food, but fast houses, but still great quality, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, learning from your mistakes is so important because uh, it's the those are the lessons that stick with me the most. Um, you know, I can sit down with somebody who's really knowledgeable about a specific topic and they can tell me everything they know and maybe 10 percent of it will stick in my brain. But if I make one mistake, I'm going to learn. Ev I'm going to remember every single detail of that mistake um, just because it's so emotionally charged. And so, you know, it's it's part of the process, just getting out there, doing things, falling on your face and then learning from those mistakes, taking it on to the next deal that you do, the next project, um, keeping a checklist so you remember exactly that mistake and then the solution to that mistake that you can bring on to the next deal. Yeah, just because you make a mistake doesn't mean you quit. I mean, it's, you know, like I never thought I'd laugh about the the wetland deal. And, yeah, you know, that, that and hurts, then, man. <laughs> now it's and fine. the uh, 50, what do you say, 56,000 for turtles? That would be, yeah. you know, that's a big uh, cost that you probably did not have in your underwriting there. Definitely not. Um, what's the build price per square foot out there in uh, for workforce housing? Yeah, so it it varies a, a bit. Um, so like when you're when you're in Central Florida, closer to Orlando, it's going to be you know about ten percent cheaper to build. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just we've got if you saw the engineering and like the the wind codes around Florida, the closer you get to the coast, obviously you have to beef up your engineering a bit. And we like I, I like to keep as many of these properties as I can. Mm. Um, so, well, I guess I'm going to go off track. Okay. So but up there in Orlando, say it's around 110, $115 a foot. Okay. Mm -hmm. To build. Um, and now there's, there's all these other variations that, that we need to add in. Like, you know, we got lot costs, we have uh, impact fees that will vary by area and County and that kind of, that kind of thing. When we get closer to the coast, we're, you know, North of $130 a mm. foot. Um, and we could probably be a little bit less than that. Um, but I also, when we get closer to the coast, I'm, I want to keep these things as long-term investments and really kind of scale the portfolio. And we sell to investors mainly. So we'll mm -hmm. sell like 5% retail and we do that to keep our, our appraised values elevated and nice comps for when I either refinance or our investors go get a loan and, you know, they've got built in equity and it helps the deal you know, underwrite a hell of a lot better for the banks and everything too. Um, but when we get closer to the coast, we do a lot of different upgrades. I got, I beef up the, the engineering. We put in extra rebar, extra concrete down cells in the, in the walls. Cause they're all concrete block. I go with an up, a upgraded shingle that can, you know, withstand 165 miles per hour wind. <laughs> Jeez. Um, we don't, we have an option to put in, um, you know, these hurricane impact glass, like this window oh, okay. behind me, I could take yeah. a glass. 
it's not going to break. Um, we don't have to do that, but it, but it makes our window packages go up, you know, five, six thousand, eight thousand dollars a house. Um, but in but, the long run, I mean, especially if you're planning on keeping them in, in your portfolio, that is, that means a lot less, uh, maintenance in the long run. And I'm sure it affects your insurance costs as well. Yeah. You know, I, I should actually spend more time on getting the studies done with the insurance companies and letting them know about all this stuff. Cause I don't think they actually take that into effect or account, but our insurance costs are, are not as crazy as people would think. Like our average house is worth in like in this area I'm in right now, we're in Sarasota County. Uh, the average house that we're doing around here has got a, an appraised value, say a 420. Um, mm -hmm. And the insurance for everything for the year is $1,200, $1,300 a, a year. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's not bad. But very, very reasonable. And it's like, once you get over the 2020 building code, these uh these insurance rates are are a lot cheaper and the mm. crazy thing before that last hurricane we had uh that one this insurance rates were you know seven eight hundred dollars so this is oh, wow yeah they were they were really a lot cheaper um but yet on top of that like when you've got 500 tenants and you've got a hurricane coming we we are prop we have a property management company here too so we manage everything for our investors and and all of our properties um, but we send out, you know, a bunch of alerts, like, you know, pull your furniture inside tropical storm alert, blah, 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 blah. you know, and people, not everybody's going to do everything, you know? Yeah. And like, it, it, it's a peace of mind for us and for, you know, 96% of our investors don't live in Florida. Hmm. So it's like, uh, you know, they can't see it, but they hear the news and the news always blows the hurricane way out of proportion. So they get really nervous. <laughs> it's like, the end of the world. Yeah, just chill out. It's all good. You don't want to worry about did 500 tenants put their hurricane shutters on, you know, so yeah. we're not going to bust it out windows all over the place. It's, so it's just like one of these things. It just it makes you sleep easy when you see that you're in the cone of a storm. So, yeah, makes sense. Well, shoot, man, we've already gone through our time. Um, I really love everything you've shared with us, um, but it is time to jump into the quick question round. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Um, starts with books or any form of education. Could be movies, could be audio books, YouTube channels, whatever. Just give me two recommendations, one for general life wisdom and then one for real estate. Yeah, general life wisdom, uh, the 10X rule, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I definitely feel like, I mean, that's like a six time a year I listen to it. If I'm feeling like I'm slacking or my, my energy level's down, that is um, like my life and business Bible. So the 10X rule by Grant Cardone. Um, for real estate, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say the, the old, uh, the old Rich one that dad, everybody's going to say. Yeah, I'll go, <laughs> I'll elevate it. And this is the honest to God truth. I love Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But the next one that, that was in the little series, the cash flow quadrant, mm -hmm. I think was definitely way more impactful. I think the first one, like it was like wonderful storytelling and gets you excited and, and you start to learn long money is much better than short money. Um, mm. And then the next level is the cash flow quadrant. I think that was a wonderful book and really makes you want to blow up your real estate portfolio into big business. So cash flow quadrant, Robert Kiyosaki. Perfect. I love it. All right. Next question is for your younger self. So let's go back to the Brock who was uh, just mowing those lawns for the banks back in the day. Go back to him, look him in the eye, give him one piece of advice moving forward. Yeah. Don't stop. So I fell on my face multiple times. You know, I remember making it to $99,000 and I thought, Ooh, I'm almost at a hundred, but I, I made it to negative before I made it to a hundred. And it was all because I've got lackadaisical and I relaxed and I thought I'd made it. And, you know, whatever you're doing to, to make yourself stack some wins, keep on doing it. I mean, you don't, you know, and mimic these people that, that are, um, that have done it, done what you wanted to do. That nothing, none of their, uh, qualities is giving up. So, you know, just keep doing what you got to do to, to, to stack your money. Yep. Yeah. I feel like for me, at least that, um, that's why celebrating wins is so important because it does give you that emotional, like, you know, that release that you're looking for, but then you just get back into it. If you know, like, I'm going to celebrate this, I'm going to take, you know, take a weekend, go fly to fucking Tahiti or wherever you want to go. Um, but then after that, just get right back to the grind because, uh, um, it's so easy to feel like you've made it once you have this arbitrary goal out in front of you. Uh, but once you get to that goal, you know, there's more to do. You're still alive. You still got to make some progress. So, 
Yeah. <laughs> Celebrate don't those wins. Slap in the face. That's the worst feeling. Getting, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Next question. Um, I think I know the answer to this one, but I'm going to ask it anyways. The United States is a big place. It's a lot of opportunity out there. Give me the single city, the single metro you're most excited about investing in today. Ooh. Um, so I'm going to go with this whole Sarasota County area. I really love it. Um, I think it's, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. We're close to some of the most beautiful beaches in the entire state. There's so much economic activity, uh, here there's, you know, it's the third to fifth richest County in the state of Florida, um, with, you know, net migration that is through the roof. This town I'm in right here, Northport, um, is the is in the top three fastest growing cities in the country for like the last five years in a row wow that's crazy yeah and we've got like the number one public school system in the entire state of florida and in sarasota county i mean just it's it's you know it checks every box for me and it's not the only place that we're doing business right now but it's where my main focus is as far as my capital um i'm most excited about this place and being able to if i have uh, any investors that back out of a deal I'm like, okay, thank you. I will keep it. I'll keep I'll it. Find a way to keep it. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I had to Google where Sar- Sarasota County was. Um, but yeah, it's just big. It's uh, right between Tampa and Fort Myers. Um, pretty. I bet it's a very beautiful area down there. It is extremely beautiful. Yeah. All right. Next question is about finding deals. It all starts with getting in contact with the seller and writing up that purchase agreement. So, what's your favorite way to generate leads and find new deals? My favorite way, and I don't think we even utilize this enough, is uh, is text campaigns. So I I loved I love text campaigns. I think it's the most successful. It's the easiest, and it's the way it's it's sort of where we're at in this this world now. Because a lot of people have gotten spoiled with texting and emailing, where they don't they're not as sociable as they used to. Maybe they're more comfortable responding to something like that instead of some cold call. Hey, let me buy your property. You know, <laughs> pay cash. And so I think that's been a, that's been a huge thing for us. Um, yeah. We use it a lot to acquire new lots. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think a really good thing to do about if you're going to do something like that, I know I'm maybe going too, too deep, but is a CRM that, you know, a lot of people have iPhones. So if you're sending an, a, a message, it shows up as the blue message. If you're sending a YouTube video, like an introduction or something, then it shows up as like a real video. They can press click. And, you know, mm. that, I think we, I found that extremely impactful and had an, a wonderful response rate from that. So, yeah, I love texting too. The issue that we've been having is that uh, most of the platforms that provide, you know, mass texting have uh, shut it down just because of like 10 DLC rules and all that kind of stuff. Um, we were using, I mean, we went through a lot. We went through um, launch control, um, uh, lead Sherpa, all the, all the platforms, but um, what platform do you guys use for texting? So now, it's, like I said, we haven't, we don't do it enough. Um, I switched everything off of, we were on Lion Desk and okay. I switched okay. it all over to Salesforce. Since I switched it to Salesforce over a, a year ago, um, I have, n- I've tried SMS 360, I think, and, and something else, but they were, they were not good. So mm. really we've, we've been really leaning on our wholesalers and mm. cold calling the last year, which is I'm not proud of because we mm. haven't been utilizing our best best thing. Yeah. Um. But but yeah, I think it's I think it's really similar to like what you just said. The the other platforms, there's a lot of restrictions, and I feel like it's it, it's not it's making it not as easy to use, um, as as it used to be. Yeah. Um. But I'm I'm still in search of of that because I love Salesforce. Well, so you can just download any app and plug it right on top of your system, and you can reach out to any one of your leads or any one of your investors or anything like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. We use, um, Monday, monday.com. I uh-huh. love Monday, but, uh, I've been tempted to switch to Salesforce just because it's like the de facto CRM. It, it integrates with everything. Um, yeah. Tempted. One of these so days, nerdy probably. dude. When we talk about Salesforce, so I, it, it is, it's unbelievable platform. I think. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, second to last question. This is about lessons learned. Uh, you've mentioned, you know, you got to fall on your face to, uh, to learn those big lessons. So what was the deal that went a little sideways for you? And then what was the biggest lesson you pulled from it? Oh boy. Um, I mean, we had that, we had to deal with the wetlands. I mean, yeah, oh, yeah. It's, it's like a, you know, fall on your face and like, you got to learn if you're going to be in a new area, you got to learn everything. And then I, you know, I've had another really tricky one where, it kind of broke up a partnership where 
you know, went into something. I, I'm going to help this guy out, get, get out of something. We were going to do a lot of stuff. And, you know, but I, I don't think it was really me that, that failed on that. I told him I wasn't going to make any money. And then at the end, you know, I didn't have a contract together. Um, so it was all, you know, him saying, oh, well, this lost money. So this is going to come off the profit of the stuff that I picked that actually made money. And, you know, I walked out of the door with with nothing, you know, basically nothing in my pocket compared to what needed to happen. Um, so, you know, do your research and and make your checklist before you make a big decision. And also, if you're going into a partnership, make sure that everything's aligned, written out and everything's, you know, on paper and signed, um, because without that, you know, you're just leaving the door wide open for a screwing. So, yep, <clears throat> yep absolutely. Partnerships, um, they can be the best thing that happens to you and they can also be the worst. So um, the way to get around that is you're right. Just make sure that everybody understands what they're going into and make sure you get it in writing. Sure. All right. That's the, brings us to the last question. This is for the listeners. I'm sure people want to reach out, get in contact with you. Um, two pointer or two parter. Uh, the first part is where can they find you? And then what can they expect when they reach out? Yeah. So you can find me. Um, well, please everybody check out our product that we build and we rent. Okay. You can go to mynewrental.com. And if you want to find out more about the product, you can go to mynewrental.com forward slash invest. And we have a little form on there. Uh, you fill it out. My team will, will will schedule a meeting. We can get on a call. We can discuss real estate. We can discuss, you know, the Florida market, whatever we're building, all that kind of stuff. I am, uh, I'm, I, I've got a social media handles that are, you know, at follow.brock um, on, you know, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, try to be active on there. Uh, I love to, I love to have conversations like this. I love to talk about real estate. If there's any way we can help each other or connect or whatever, you know, reach out um, because I love to talk business and, and real estate. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I'll put that link in the show notes. So if y'all want to reach out, just click the little more in the description. It'll pull down that full description and in there you can find Brock's links. All right, man, that wraps it up. Thank you very much for hopping on the show. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Friday. For everybody who's here with us today, thank you guys for showing up. You are the reason we do this. So if you guys have any questions, reach out to me, Gabe, at the real estate investing club.com. If you want to support the show, just give us a like, subscribe, share. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great week. Keep rocking real estate. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.